Hi there. From the headquarters of the People's Daily in Beijing, this is People's Daily Talk. Joining me for today's discussion is Dr. Xiaojun Grace Wang. She is the Deputy Director at the United Nations Office for South-South Cooperation. Grace, it's great to have you here. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I know you have been working for the UN for many, many years, and can you tell us how, how does it feel to work for the UN? Well, I have been working for United Nations for 16 years. Um, I think, in one word, it's a job that is closest to my heart. Mm -hmm. um, because every day you feel that you are working for a big cause, and that is for a peaceful uh, world that mm -hmm. people will have their choices for the kind of life they would like to have. Um, so I feel like you know nothing else can compare to the joy it brings. Mm -hmm. So I really enjoy working in the United Nations. It's fun. That's great. Uh, I know there are many people probably want to join the UN family as well, not only Chinese, but people from all around the world. Maybe can you give them some suggestion? I know the hiring process is very competitive. Uh, yeah, I think the, uh, it's a very good thing that many people mm -hmm. feel the same kind of passion that I feel for the United Nations. Uh, my advice to them is, I guess everybody knows that you only feel the joy when you really contribute. Right. So some young people came to me right after college or universities saying that, oh, how can I join this kind of job that's so lofty and it's such an honor. Mm -hmm. um, my advice to them is always to uh, find the best, uh, the most suitable job for you first and then diverse your experience, learn from your experience. Everything learned can contribute to, um, to at a point when you really enter the UN. For example, uh, my experience comes from working in media in university time. And then I worked for the government of China. Uh, I worked in a university. I worked uh, for Asia Europe Foundation in Singapore, uh, and then I joined the United Nations. So, so many years I feel I benefited so much from my diverse experience before joining UN. For example, in United Nations, you have to work sometimes as a diplomat. You need to negotiate. Mm -hmm. You need to make public speeches uh, to advocate for the agenda. So that I benefit from my years of experience in the media. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the qualifications that they should have if they want to work for the UN? Oh, yes, you need to be a good advocate. Mm -hmm. um, and also uh, the years of experience working in the government, I mm -hmm. understand the policy making process and also the challenges that policymakers face every day. So mm -hmm. my policy advisory role would benefit my, from my experiences in the government. It's just mm -hmm. a few examples. My advice to young people, meaning that always try to do what you know, best suits you, mm -hmm. and then prepare yourself well for this kind of uh, job if you really think mm -hmm. you're passionate about it. Right. Now you are doing South-South Cooperation. You are also a poverty reduction expert. Uh, that means inevitably you need to travel to places with poor conditions. Sometimes there's no clean water, probably there's no um, <clears throat> toilet, or even sometimes harsh conditions. There probably is malaria. You know, how do you usually handle those kind of uh, situations? Uh, can you recall some of your most difficult time you have ever been through? Uh, I think those are not the most difficult moments, those are the mm -hmm. most touching moments actually. I really like uh, going to the field uh, to work and live with people in the field because I'm, I feel I'm just one of them. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, maybe I have the privilege of enjoying clean water, um, uh, you know, the, the big city life. Mm -hmm. um, but when I'm there, I feel people there, they are the same as me. They are full of energy and full of passion to change the situation, to make it better. And I feel by being with them, I could bring some hope, confidence or some knowledge. 
and I feel I can contribute to that. Um, yeah, if you want me to give an example, maybe I gave you an example about South-South cooperation. Mm -hmm. uh, I traveled to Cape Verde, uh, an island country. In uh, Africa. In Africa, mm -hmm. directly from New York. I thought I could fly there uh, within hours because I looked at the map. It's just, you know, it's not far away from yeah. each other. But the reality is I had mm -hmm. to travel through Europe and then transfer somewhere in Africa and then go to this small island country. So I asked myself why. Um, it's because I guess they're lacking uh, basic infrastructure. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no big airport that can actually handle all those uh, passengers and not that large capacity. Um, so that gives me a lot of uh, incentive for working mm -hmm. even harder in South-South cooperation because South-South cooperation emphasizes a lot on basic infrastructure. And when I saw so many airports being built by Chinese companies in Africa, I feel there's hope. Um, so at the conference I attended in Cape Verde, because my experience of traveling all the way there. Um, although very tired, I feel I have more to say at the advocacy level. Mm -hmm. So my speech at the conference was just immediate. It's, you know, I talked about the role of basic infrastructure for people's life. I talked about how international development agenda mm -hmm. should pay attention to this. I talked about the achievements of South-South cooperation in this regard. So I think traveling to poor places and meet the people and feel the life yourself can give you a lot of uh, uh, inspiration for your work. Right. I actually read a report on you, Grace. So you once told a reporter you traveled to a remote area in China's Yunnan province, and then you met an elderly people who was sort of asking for medical help because it was in a very remote area. At the time, you could do nothing, and then you felt a little bit helpless at that time. Um, so what, and then you question yourself, should I continue with this undertaking? So what changed your mind later? Because now you're still in this career. Yeah, I guess that was a story. Thank you for finding it. It was a story happened I maybe did some research. <laughs> <laughs> over 15 years ago when I was young. <laughs> um, I was a little bit frustrated by uh, things that I couldn't help immediately by mm -hmm. giving. But now I have a different understanding of this. I actually feel that um, sometimes when you can immediately give, you are satisfying your own desire to be a kind person, to be a nice uh, a, a pair of warm hands. But I'm not working for that satisfaction now. I'm working in development. Development needs passion and patience. Uh, so I feel now what I'm doing, uh, advocating at global level for the right type of policies that support people, for the right international cooperation that will benefit people's life, will eventually benefit more people. And it may not immediately satisfy my desire to be a helpful person, but as long as in the long run it benefits the world, which I'm also benefiting, um, I feel that's a bigger meaning that I'm pursuing. Yeah, indeed. If everybody contributes, we can together create a better world. Yes, and also you need to feel that you're not only contributing, you are actually living in the world. The world is better not for the poor people. The world is mm -hmm. better for every one of us. Mm -hmm. um, and. You don't see yourself just as yourself, as uh, you worked on something and then you looked at it, you immediately feel that a sense of achievement. Mm -hmm. In development, I don't think that sense of achievement comes so easily. For example, there are still wars in the world and a bomb can destroy what you have done in development for years. Mm -hmm. So should you be discouraged at that moment? Or should you think that, okay, so I'm more, we together are more needed to create a world that is more peaceful? I guess I would choose the bigger 
meaning kind of approach now. Maybe because I'm, maybe age helped or <laughs> I don't know. I just thought about it years after years. Yeah. That's great. I mean, your job can give you a lot of inspiration and, you know, you can reflect on your experience. Um, I know this time you, you are attending a education program for South, South Cooperation where the program gathers some 20 uh, government officials from many developing countries. They are here to sort of learn the Chinese development experience. I mean, China uh, <clears throat> has achieved miraculous, a very impressive economic growth or social development. And other than finance and e economics, where the program are offering, what other, other areas do you think developing countries would be mostly interested to learn from China's fast development? Hmm. China has, sent, uh, has set a clear example for the world in poverty eradication. So China has lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, and that is very inspiration, uh, inspirational for other developing countries. Uh, I think it's not just a good example. It also gives other developing countries a confidence, a sense of confidence that if you pursue your development path, if you keep learning from others, and if, if you keep thinking about how to resolve your own development issues by collective wisdom, you can achieve it. So that sense of confidence is more important than money, than concrete technology or anything else. I think that's China's most important contribution to the world. Uh, in terms of what they can learn from China, I think China is very good at scaling up development successes. Uh, we have done development for decades but many of the success are uh, just at project level. When project finish, the success disappear. Or it becomes an island of success, never get connected to other things and never achieve impact at scale. However, if you look at China's development path, China usually tests out a new approach in the local community, in a city or in a province, and then when it's successful, it's very quick to spread the knowledge to other provinces, and it's very quick to influence the policy so that it becomes a national uh, movement. I think that kind of scaling up uh, strategy is very valuable to the world development. And South-South cooperation is a way to help scaling up development successes across borders. Developing countries, some of them are facing similar challenges in development. So if one success, one good solution is generated from one country, we should help them to spread the lessons learned and the knowledge to other developing countries. And together we can achieve a bigger impact uh, for people's life. So you mentioned about poverty reduction. I think in the last four decades also, China has lifted about 700 million people out of poverty. I mean, how on earth is this possible, in your opinion? Yeah, this requires a comprehensive uh, strategy to eradicate poverty. Uh, in China, we have every like five year uh, poverty eradication strategy. And it requires a lot of political will, strong political support to make it happen. It also requires the policy making to be enabling. Um, but very important, it needs action. I think in China, the implementation of policies is uh, very efficient. Um, so all this combined from political will to policy design to implementation and to learn from all the process and to scale it up. I think this is the, the key to success. And that's why China can really achieve this kind of result. Mm -hmm. And also, I mean, we talk about the one side of China. China is the super economic power, now world second in terms of GDP. But there is also the other side of China. Statistics show that in 2017, China still have three, 30 million people 
living under the national poverty line. So there's a long way to go before China, you know, totally eradicate extreme poverty. So how do you think China can better finish the, you know, finish the last mile of achieving this goal? Yeah, China is indeed um, facing this last mile challenge of poverty eradication. And that's why I think now China is taking the right action to have more accurately targeted poverty eradication efforts. Mm -hmm. I think China can actually um, engage more anthropologist uh, methodology and to have more in-depth need assessment of poverty issues in communities, in marginal, uh, marginalized groups. Um, so your measures to reduce poverty can be refined and designed with the people at the center for those areas that are left behind. Uh, this China can also learn from South-South cooperation from other developing countries. There are some programs that, is, that are generated from other developing countries are targeting at the last mile issues. So while China is sharing its own experience of large scale poverty reduction, China can also learn from accurately targeted poverty eradication methods. So the key is about precision, uh, precision targeting at the moment. I think that is a very effective approach to use, especially when you have pockets of poverty at mm -hmm. the end, while the um, overall situation is very good. Mm -hmm. Okay, now let's talk a, talk a little bit about the Chinese model, because in the past decades, China's uh, economic has uh, China's economy has grown more than two hundred times. I mean, many people would feel like, wow, that's probably a miracle. In your opinion, when you talk about the Chinese model, how do you define the character characteristics of the Chinese model? People say China's economy is more export driven, labor intensive, manufacturing you know, and etc. How do you define the Chinese model? I think the Chinese model is not simply um, defined from the economic perspective. I'm not an economist, first of all. Um, I think China's development model is a comprehensive package of promoting not only uh, economic growth, but also invested a lot in education in health, in building people's capacity. So economic growth never happens just in isolation. As if, if you find the right e uh, economic theory, you would be able to grow fast and sustainable. I think it's supported by a solid foundation of capacity of the society. Okay. so. At the beginning of this year, China launched its first international development cooperation agency. That's a move interpreted by many experts by the Chinese government to increase its foreign aid. I mean, how do you see the significance behind this move? Oh, I think this is very important. It's again setting a new, a good example for other developing countries. South-South cooperation has been there for decades. However, South-South cooperation has been facing a new challenge now, which is most of the South-South cooperation projects are project-based. And now we need more systematic support to South-South cooperation so that it can contribute to its maximum impact for sustainable development. Uh, that requires institutional support. At international level, United Nations are supporting South-South cooperation and in a coordinated manner. At regional level, there are regional mechanisms, regional organizations promoting South-South cooperation. At national level, we see some developing countries more and more realize that they should also coordinate their country's support to South-South cooperation. And by setting up a new agency, I think it's very um, helpful to coordinate all the different efforts and to build synergy so that the impact can be maximized. And we look forward to work with this new agency. 
So with uh, improved coordination, that might help China to improve its efficiency in delivering aids. Exactly. China's Belt and Road Initiative, for example, has laid out five priorities, from policy harmonization to people-to-people mm -hmm. -to -people understanding, including connectivity and trade investment, financial uh, support. How can these five dimensions implemented by all different sectors contributing together to development goals. I think coordination is very useful. Coordination doesn't mean control or tight management. It means sharing more information, promoting synergy, mm -hmm. so that what you do, what I do, can contribute to a bigger goal together. Yeah. I know that developed countries such as US and UK has set up a development agency for many, many years. How do you think China can learn from them with the launch of this agency? Oh, that's a very good question. I think uh, developed countries has set up their development uh, agency and they are very good at working with multilateral platforms. Because when you do have an agency working with multilateral platforms, you can immediately influence and contribute towards global policy making. And that global policy environment can also enable you, your agency, your programs, your activities to be more targeted and feeding into uh, the creation of an overall enabling environment. Um, that, I think, the new agency in China probably can also uh, learn from those established agencies how to best leverage international systems. United mm -hmm. Nations is everybody's United Nations. How can uh, the new agency leverage United Nations support? Uh, how can the new multilateral institutions like AIIB, BRICS Bank work together with this new agency? Mm -hmm. So I guess that's what they, ca they can learn from the developed countries. I would like to also bring your attention to a historic opportunity where this new agency and China overall, um, you know, all actors working in South-South cooperation in China, including other ministries, to join, which is uh, in 2019, next year, March, uh, the United Nations will organize the second high-level conference on South-South cooperation to commemorate 40th anniversary of Buenos Aires action, a plan of action for South-South cooperation. This is a milestone for South-South cooperation. And at that conference, member states of the United Nations will um, define South-South cooperation in the new era, identify opportunities and challenges, talk about how globally, regionally, and nationally we can best support South-South cooperation through strengthened institutions. So this is an opportunity for countries like China to contribute. I know China is actively preparing for that, and we would like to support as much as we can. Uh, the UN Office for South-South cooperation works as a secretariat for that conference. Um, you know, some experts say that China's assistance to developing country focus more on infrastructure, you know, uh, manufacturing those productive sectors. On the other hand, uh, Western aids tend to focus more on the soft side, like governments, govern, governance, institution building, and etc. You know, do you agree with that statement? How how would you compare those, uh, you know, two types of? Uh, assistance. Yes, I think uh, if you look at the statistics, that's true. I see this as natural, uh, and I think South-South uh, cooperation complements North-South cooperation, and it doesn't replace North-South cooperation. One fundamental principle of South-South cooperation is demand-driven. So South-South cooperation respond to the demand of the partner countries and basic infrastructure is one very real need and demanded by developing countries. We also need to remember South-South cooperation is for mutual benefits. 
So you have to utilize the country's comparative advantage to cooperate. China does have the comparative advantage in basic infrastructure, in productive capacity enhancement. So you contribute what you, you can do best. Yeah, so that I think is a very natural thing, yeah. Great. So when we're talking about international development, there are many people still have this misconception. They think about, you know, development, international development is merely about develop the country, doing charity, you know, to developing countries. Obviously, that's not true. You know, how would you correct them on that uh, uh, conception? Uh, I think, yeah, as you said, development is not charity. If you look at the world, which country has developed because of charity? Which country has developed because they received plenty of money given by, donated by another friendly country? Yeah. I think, um, yeah, that's a misconception. Development is about enlarging people's choices. So development cooperation should help to enlarge people's choices to live the life that they would like to live. I think uh, South-South cooperation by addressing the demands of the country and uh, by helping each other to achieve a better world, that is the true meaning of development. I know there are also questions saying that, oh, China, you are still a developing country, you have a lot of challenges, why you go to help another country? You have plenty of problem to solve uh, domestically. But I, I believe that 30 million people are still living under the national poverty line. Yeah, yeah, but I think, let me ask you a question. If a kid in, uh, let's see, a, a very remote, poor country mm -hmm. is starving, would that affect your own sense of happiness? So I think if that question is resounding in many people's mind, then you wouldn't question why you have a problem nearby, you're still helping outside, because we all live in the same world and we are interconnected nowadays. And that's why I think uh, China's vision of building a common uh, shared future for the world, and I understand truly why China is saying that Belt and Road it's not a solo, it needs everybody mm -hmm. to make it a symphony. Yeah, yeah exactly. Everybody needs to contribute, every nation needs to contribute. Some experts say with a more robust growth from emerged countries, uh -huh, robust growth. that can also contribute to the growth of the whole world. That's why we also need to do international development. Yes, indeed. Uh, of mm. course, uh, 2008, uh, the world economic crisis, after that, I think China has done its best effort to keep its stable, uh, steady economic growth, and that helped the whole world to respond to the crisis. Mm -hmm. um, and China's growth, um, you know, in the past decade has shown the example and gave a confidence. And China's contribution to the world economy is enormous. So I think, yes, robust growth is important, but it's not the only important thing for successful cooperation for a better world. Because in our perspective, no matter you are rich or poor, no matter you are big or small, you contribute equally to global governance. Mm -hmm. Yes, reality means there are still capacity gaps and there are countries who are facing temporary uh, economic setbacks and I don't want that to reduce our confidence in a future that is featuring cooperation, prosperity and peace. Mm -hmm. Now my last question, so with, this with the launch of uh, this in development agency, what are the areas would you expect China enhanced cooperation with multilateral multi organizations such as the UN? Uh, I think uh, if we think about thematic areas, uh, China definitely emphasized a lot on poverty eradication and that uh, the whole world is also looking for China's sharing of its own knowledge in poverty eradication. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think there are several sustainable development goals that developing countries are facing significant gaps. 
uh, if you read the SG's, the UN Secretary General's report on the UN system reform, it emphasized SDGs such as water sanitation, uh, renewable energy. Um, these are all um, important areas that developing countries are struggling. I think these areas that the new agency could think about working with um, UN agencies. Another area that this agency could consider, I would suggest, is about knowledge. Um, because China has explored, um, not only China, South-South cooperation has explored its own approach for development cooperation. Many new ways of doing things can add to the knowledge of international discourse for development cooperation. So China should not only doing things, but also mobilize think tanks to create knowledge based on evidence and contribute to the global knowledge base. Uh, that I think is a very important area this agency could do. Uh, we have supported the establishment of a global coalition of think tank networks on South-South cooperation. This involves over 250 think tanks all over the world, covering all developing countries. We would like to provide this platform for the new agency to work together. Uh, I think the third aspect I would like to emphasize is global governance. Uh, China and other developing countries are playing a more active role nowadays to influence global governance and to participate in dialogues that will shape global development agenda. And I think this new agency, everybody is looking at it and it's a rising new star and can definitely bring China's voice, perspectives into the global forum. It's great to have you, Grace. Thank you so much for your sharing. Thank you very much for the interview. Hope to see you next time. Yeah, Thank see you, you next so much. time. Thank you. Okay. Oh. <laughs>